was about this Easter Sunday morning, celebrating the risen Christ. Revelation 1, verses 17 to 18 says, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. What a glorious truth to ponder. Jesus is not the great I was, but rather the great I am. He is not only a historical fact, but a present day living reality. The whole system of Christianity rests upon the truth that Jesus Christ rose from the grave and is now seated at the Father's right hand as our personal advocate. Christ the Lord is risen today has been one of the church's most popular Easter hymns since it was first written by Charles Wesley just one year after his heartwarming experience at the Aldersgate Hall in London in 1738. If all of our eternity is to be realized on this side of the grave, we are hopeless and to be pitied as we find in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. But for the Christian, the resurrection assures us of God's tomorrow. This anticipation makes it possible to live joyfully today, regardless of life's circumstances. The message of the resurrection is to come and see, to personally experience the transforming power of the living Christ, then to go and tell. Carry this hymn of triumph with you today and the days that lie ahead. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah.
Father God, we thank you for Easter Sunday. 
We thank you that Good Friday was not the end, but the start of something new. The start of something new and amazing in the relationship between God and humanity. We thank you for your son Jesus who rose on this day, this day that we're celebrating as this Easter Sunday. And Father God, we thank you for all that means to us. That he came to give us life and have it in all its fullness as we can read in John 10.10. 10. And Father God, we thank you that we are not people of Good Friday, but people of Easter Sunday and looking forward towards Pentecost when your plan was made complete and your Holy Spirit was left with us. Help us to celebrate that great news, that hallelujah, Christ has risen. Help us to shout it from the rooftops, to share it with our family and our neighbours and those we work with. Help us to constantly live in that relationship with you that celebrates that you are a risen saviour that you live within us, that you live within our lives, and that you're evident in what we say and what we do. So Father God, as we continue in our act of worship to you, may our worship be fitting, and may you bless us and use us as a church united. This we ask through that blessed name of your dear Son, Jesus. Amen and Amen. Good morning. Happy Easter, everyone. Our Salvation Army music almost always contains a message that brings inspiration and blessing. The march I've chosen for this morning is no exception that it tells the Easter story and also gives the testimony of every Christian. Noel Jones's march, He Lives, uses the song 229 in the songbook. O joyful sound, O glorious hour, when Christ by his almighty power rose and left the grave. Now let our songs his triumph tell, who broke the chains of death and hell, and ever lives to save. He lives, he lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. And then the chorus comes in the music. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. It's my story and experience. He lives, he lives. Jesus is alive in me. Hallelujah. I hope and pray that you know that to be true in your own life as well. Here's the march then. He lives. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. The Bible says he is not here. He is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And of course, that's talking about Jesus no longer being in the tomb. He died on Good Friday. He rose on Easter Sunday. He wasn't there anymore. Um, so exciting. And I know a few weeks ago, I was talking to you about good news. Well, this is the ultimate good news um, that Jesus didn't stay in the tomb. Um, he died on the cross for our sins. But then a few days later, he rose again, just as he said he would. Um, and just going back a little bit. So back to when Jesus did die, the curse at the temple where people would worship was torn in two from top to bottom. Now you can't, don't just imagine the curtains in your living room, those size curtains. Um, I'm going to give a little example of what happened but obviously it was way bigger than this. So as soon as he died the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the curtains Back in the day in the temple, the Bible tells us they were about 60 feet tall, 60 feet tall and four inches thick. So I'm sort of just under six foot, it's like 10 times of me up. Yeah, so it's not an easy feat to tear these curtains in two. So back in the day, there was that barrier sort of in between man and God worshipping. But however, when Jesus came along, it literally meant that there was no barrier between us and God. N nothing stopping us from worshipping him because Jesus just gives us full access to do that. And there's a song that we have sung before um, at junior camp called My Redeemer Lives. And we're going to listen to it now and feel free to sing along. It speaks about Jesus lifting our burdens, so the stuff that weighs us down and gets us sad. It speaks about us lifting those burdens away. It speaks about how Jesus' blood has covered our sins, so taken away the wrong that we've done um, when he hung there on the cross and that because he's alive, he lives the redeemer that saves us and that is the best news ever. So I hope you enjoy your Easter Sunday.
Good morning and greetings from sunny Scotland on this beautiful and glorious resurrection morning. Happy Easter, everyone. It's my privilege to come and share with you this morning and to read to you from God's word. The reading is taken from John's Gospel and chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple started off for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who had been behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Amen. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Generals John Gowans and John Larson are internationally known for their musical partnership that spanned a lifetime of friendship and produced 10 musicals. Songs from the musicals continue to bless and inspire generations around the world. In the musical Jesus Folk, the song He Came to Give Us Life in All Its Fullness, number 139 in the Salvation Army Songbook, serves as an uplifting celebration of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. In John 10.10, Jesus affirmed, I am come that they might have life and have it to the full. Having life to the full, or more abundantly in the King James Version, is a vivid, powerful description of life in Christ. The Greek phrase means to have a superabundance of a thing. The fundamental, glorious truth is that to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to know who he is and what he has accomplished, is to possess a new, lasting, superabundance of life. The tune and the words are perfectly wed. Believers cannot sing more jubilant, affirming words than he came to give us life in all his fullness. He came to make the blind to see. He came to banish death and doubt and darkness. He came to set his people free. He came to give us life in all its fullness. He came to make the blind to see. He came to banish death and doubt and darkness. He came to set his
rated men the tainted and defiled. We wonder why, we wonder why the Son of God as man came down. What does this signify? He came to give us life in all its fullness. He came to make the blind to see. He came to banish death and doubt and Once again to smile He came to bind the broken hearted And God and man to reconcile He came to give us life in all its fullness He came to make the blind to see He came to banish death and doubt and darkness He came to set his people free We wonder why Christ came into the world And let men should have to die, does anybody know? We wonder why, we wonder why the Son of God and man came down. What does this signify? He came to give us life in all its fullness. He came to make the blind to see. He came to banish death and doubt and Once again to smile He came to bind the broken hearted And God and man to reconcile He came to give us life in all its fullness He came to make the blind to see He came to banish death and doubt and darkness He came to set his people free He came to Good morning everyone on this Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive, death has lost its victory and the grave has been denied. The title of the song, Jesus is Alive, sung by the Staff Songsters. Arimathea and Nicodemus had taken the body of Jesus and buried it reverently, if hurriedly, in the garden sepulchre. But nothing could 
could take away the sorrow from their hearts. Jesus had been buried just before six o'clock on Friday afternoon. Saturday was the Jewish Sabbath, and the disciples and their friends must have spent it behind closed doors, unable to express their own misery. Before dawn the next day, one of Jesus' friends was tired of doing nothing. Her name was Mary Magdalene, and she found herself hurrying toward the garden too. She had no clear idea what she expected to find or what she hoped to do. Well, talk about a shock on top of a shock. Friday had been the worst day of her life. The one she thought had come to save the world, the one who had saved her, was executed by the authorities. And she couldn't do anything but stand by and watch him die. And now she had come to the tomb where they had laid his body. The tomb was standing wide open and no body was in sight. What a shock that must have been. We have seen new news clips of enough funeral processions in the Middle East to learn how emotional a time is the death of a friend or relative there. There is no quiet, stoic acceptance of death. There is rather loud and visible mourning at a time of grief. It is important, especially in those cultures, to pay one's respects to the dead. That's all Mary Magdalene had in mind that Sunday morning, doing her duty, paying her respects. I imagine she was thinking about what she would say to the guards or others who happened to be there when she arrived. She went early, perhaps so she wouldn't need to talk to many people. Then she arrived and found nobody, nothing. No guards, no mourners, no clergy, no seated tomb, sealed tomb, and no corpse. First the cross, and now this. So she ran to the disciples with the news that the corpse was nowhere to be found. They, of course, couldn't trust a hysterical female. So Peter and John ran to see for themselves. It's interesting how John records this for us in our text. The other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. Notice how John got there first, leaned over and peeked in, and then Peter caught up and walked right into the tomb. He then saw things in great detail, linen wrapping lying there, and the head cloth neatly rolled up and over her ear by itself. This was not evidence of grave robbers, or secretive work. When John saw, John saw all this, he came to faith. At least he believed that Jesus was not taken away as a dead man, but rather had risen from the dead. The men left the scene, and then Mary bent over and looked in, and saw more than the men had seen. She saw two angels. Then she turned to face the garden, and saw a man she took for the gardener. It wasn't until she heard Jesus pronounce her name that she recognized him as the risen Lord. So she went back to where the disciples were meeting and announced the good news. I have seen the Lord. It's hard for us to imagine how these words, I have seen the Lord, would have been heard by these Jewish men. There are echoes in the words of the scriptures. It was Job who, after hearing the theological reasoning of his friends, and then hearing the thunder of God's own voice, said to the Lord, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. And it was the great prophet Isaiah who declared, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Now here was this woman claiming that she had seen the risen Lord. Would God give such a revelation to a woman first? That's almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself. But there it was. She was right about the open tomb, the empty tomb. 
Peter and John had seen that themselves. Now here, she was telling them that she had seen the Lord and that he had given her a message for them. What did she mean by, I have seen the Lord? Was that wishful thinking? Was it hallucination? Had she had a vision of heaven? In what sense had she seen the Lord? John also believed after seeing just the empty tomb and the burial clothes. But what did he believe? We are not told that. We are told simply that he believed after having seen. Later, Jesus would appear to 10 of the disciples and they were forced to believe. Then even later, Jesus would tell Thomas that people would be blessed to believe without seeing. Paul would write that faith comes from hearing. Christian faith, you see, is more than a decision that certain events have happened. Christian faith is entrusting ourselves to the living God, believing that God can overcome even death for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether the evidence of God's power and love comes to us through the eyes or the ears. The important result is our trust in that the God who raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the grave will care for us for eternity. Easter, like spring, means new life and fresh hope. It means there is a future, the summer, as well as a past, our winter. Let us sit back and listen as the International Staff Songsters bring us the song, I have seen the glory of the Lord and know that God is ever present and eternal.
Shall we pray? And Lord God, you love this world so much that you gave your one and only Son that we might be called your children too. Lord, help us to live in the gladness and grace of Easter Sunday every day. Let us have hearts of thankfulness for your sacrifice. Let us have eyes that look upon your grace and rejoice in our salvation. Help us to walk in that mighty grace and tell your good news to the world. All for your glory do we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 says, But thanks be to God, he gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the ancient world, no celebration was considered more glorious than the march of triumphant returning warriors through their capital city. Many visual depictions have been made of the victorious Roman soldiers in the early centuries, marching proudly through the streets and arches of Rome, leading captive slaves and hearing the boisterous approval of cheering admirers. Christ our Saviour fought the greatest battle of all time against the prince of this world and of all his legions. Our Lord returned triumphant to his Father, having conquered not only sin, death and the grave, but Satan and hell also. Now he sits on the Father's right hand as the ruler of his kingdom and our personal advocate before God. But the day of our celebration is just ahead. One can picture with imagination the procession that will occur in heaven when Christ himself leads his bride, the church, through the heavenly portals amidst the shouts and songs of praise and glory to the risen, conquering Son. I pray that you will live in the triumphant promise of the joy that you will one day experience with all fullness when you share in the heavenly celebration with the saints of the ages. But for now, Raise your voices and praise to our victorious Lord on this Easter Sunday morning. Thine is the glory, risen, conquering Son. And may God continually keep you all both now and forevermore. Have a blessed Easter Sunday.